This talk will focus on severe and difficult to treat asthma in adults. As a pulmonologist, these groups comprise the bulk of my clinical practice for the past 20 years. Severe Asthma 2018 comprises the latest advances in diagnosis, biologic treatments, and most importantly, the development of phenotypic patterns and biomarkers, which has transformed the entire discipline. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Severe asthma consists of continued severe respiratory symptoms, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, cough, and most importantly, exercise limitation despite aggressive inhalational and oral therapy. The diagnosis is established with a comprehensive pulmonary function study demonstrating expiratory airflow limitation and air trapping. These symptoms are uncontrolled despite treatment with high-dose inhaled steroids, long-acting beta agonists, or treatment with systemic steroids for at least half the previous year. I note high-dose inhaled steroids is not standardized and is different with each and every pulmonologist. The differential diagnosis of severe asthma is extensive, and this is not a comprehensive list, but a reasonable list. One needs to consider obesity, and there is an obesity-associated phenotype with asthma. Early chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in your concurrent smokers, bronchiectasis, acute interstitial lung disease, and of course, the old standby cystic fibrosis. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency needs to be seriously considered in that um, if diagnosed is treatable and often the diagnosis can be made free of charge. It is secondary to the, uh, the, to the damage to the serpina gene and uncontrolled neutrophil elastase activity in the lung. Cardiac disease, pulmonary hypertension, vocal cord dysfunction um, is a uh, not an uncommon entity that occurs in the younger population. There's another entity known as dynamic airway collapse where you have floppy airways which can be related to tracheobronchomalacia and this can only be diagnosed by a dynamic CT of the chest or by uh, direct diagnostic bronchoscopy. Medication related cough the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are typical. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis are very common in California and the San Joaquin Valley. And we see this very frequently and it coexists with severe asthma. Churg Strauss syndrome or now called for whatever reason eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis is a zebra gastroesophageal reflux disease, maybe, and then if you have significant nocturnal symptoms, obstructive sleep apnea. Factors that might contribute to the persistence of severe asthma despite maximum treatment would be, of course, number one, incorrect inhaler technique. This must be demonstrated in the office and observed. Also, individuals who are over the age of 60 and possibly may be developing dementia, you may consider moving altogether to nebulized treatments to uh, remove this from the equation. Poor adherence with control of therapy, very reasonable. Beta blockers, very uncommon but certainly worth discussing. Individuals with aspirin sensitive asthma, smoking or environmental tobacco smoke is a big aggravator, allergen exposure which is continued, uh, is important. Um, also, illicit drug use in our long, younger population is becoming very common, especially the way they use methamphetamines uh, may be a factor. Obesity, again, gastroesophageal reflux disease, poorly controlled rhinosinus disease with polyposis needs to be examined. And the final um, um, issue is pregnancy. Pregnancy 
cannot be underestimated as a factor in the persistence of asthma. It is a major factor in complications in the newborn and, should, and the physician should not be cavalier, should be aggressively treated. Asthma is a heterogeneous syndrome encompassing different clinical phenotypes. A phenotype is the observable characteristics of the disease and most of the asthma phenotypes are associated with cellular inflammation in the airway, sputum, and blood. An endotype is the inflammatory immunologic mechanism that drives the asthma phenotype and we're going to just review type 2 and non-type 2 inflammatory endotypes. Each phenotype may have one or more endotypes driving their clinical presentation. This is the most important component of this talk because this has really transformed the discipline of asthma management from just five to ten years ago. Asthma endotypes in general consists of type 2 inflammation which is activated by environmental antigens. And if we uh, look at the main mechanisms of type 2 inflammation, we're dealing with the type 2 helper T cell, leading to the activation of interleukin 4, 5, and 13. In non-type 2 inflammation, which is aggravated by irritants, pollutants, microbes, and viruses with secondary infection, are um, regulated by the type uh, 17 helper T cell in general, leading to IL-6, IL-17, IL-8, and then interferon gamma, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and leukotriene B4. Clearly distinct endotypes. Type 2 inflammation is also known as eosinophilic inflammation. Allergens act through the actions of thymic stromal lymphoprotein which is generated, which then stimulates the helper T cells and another cell type, the innate lymphoid cells, to release cytokines. Type 2 cytokines are interleukin 4, interleukin 5, and interleukin 13. Interleukin 4 leads to immunoglobulin E production and the activation of mast cells. Interleukin 5 leads to the activation of eosinophils and interleukin-13 leads to hyperresponsiveness, remodeling of the airway, mucus production, smooth muscle constriction, and hypertrophy. Mast cells in general, once activated, lead to the release of prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and histamine. And then numerous downstream inflammatory markers. Non-type 2 inflammation, also known as non-eosinophilic, is the result of activation of the innate immune system via type 17 helper T cells by infection, pollutants, etc. The lack of eosinophilia in the blood has been used to define non-type 2 inflammation. The dominant inflammatory cell type are neutrophils, mixed granulocyte inflammatory cells, or very few inflammatory cells. Uh, one phenotype is known as POSI granulocytic, less than 40% sputum neutrophils when assessed, mixed granulocytic, both type 2 um, markers and sputum eosinophils, correction, sputum neutrophils greater than 40%, and neutrophilic asthma phenotype with sputum neutrophilia greater than 40 to 76 percent. Uh, these uh, phenotypes are, um, are, are important to be mindful of because they do change your entire treatment approach. This particular uh, type of inflammation and in endotype is usually corticosteroid resistant. This is a description and a histology slide of a normal airway. The inner airway wall is green, as you could see, with the, labeled with the green arrow. Smooth muscle 
is labeled, which then follows, followed by the outer airway wall, which is the blue arrow, and then the alveolar attachment. This is a very nice, healthy looking airway with minimal mucus and debris in the airway um, opening. Now, small airway disease is quite dramatic on a histology slide. The first thing we see is um, epithelial hyperplasia and mucus plugs. The entire airway is filled with mucus and debris and the black squares demonstrate the epithelial hyperplasia. We see prominent smooth muscle hyperplasia as well with the atorisks. Thickened basement membrane with the arrowheads and then extensive adventitial eosinophilic and lymphocytic inflammation extending into the areas of the alveolar attachments where the arrows are located. Eosinophilic airway inflammation is our first phenotype. What we see is elevated interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13 expression. This also includes the allergic asthma endotype, allergic rhinitis, and the uh, panacea of atopic disorders. These individuals classically de benefit more from inhaled corticosteroids. It also identifies a group of patients who are appropriate for biologic therapies, which target eosinophils, omeluzumab, mepoluzumab, reslimunab, benralizumab, and something called tezepalumab. Tezepalumab is interesting because it can be used for both type 2 and non-type 2 inflammation. However, it is not FDA approved yet. Neutrophilic inflammation is our second phenotype. These um, individuals have activation of uh, CD4 uh, T helper cell 17 cells which play a major role in attracting and stimulating neutrophils. We see elevated biomarkers of interleukin 6, interleukin 17, C-reactive protein and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Corticosteroids inhibit neutrophil apoptosis which may prolong airway neutrophilia. This is a new finding and um, most concerning um, given that many of these patients are on high dose inhaled and oral prednisone um, as a treatment approach. Continued use of steroids to treat severe neutrophilic asthma may complicate the diagnosis of neutrophilic phenotype asthma. Ex-smokers and current smokers have predominant neutrophilic inflammation, which is a key uh, note uh, in the uh, diagnosis and treatment of this disorder. There are treatments um, but um, they are limited in terms of effectiveness. For example, macrolide antibiotics, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, usually the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, uh, the um, biologic known as tezepulumab, uh, tiotropium, and statins may have limited or selective efficacy. There are no FDA approved therapies for this particular phenotype. Asthma biomarkers are useful. Uh, in establishing the diagnosis of type 2 versus non-type 2 inflammation. Sputum eosinophilia, greater than 2%, secondary to IL-5. Bronchoalveolar lavage eosinophils, greater than 2%, again, secondary to IL-5. Blood eosinophilia, greater than 200 cells per microliter, secondary to IL-5. The um, marker serum periostin. Uh, which reflects interleukin-13 inflammation, total serum immunoglobulin E level, reflective of IL-4, and then um, if your office is so equipped, fraction of exhaled nitric oxide, uh, which is elevated, predicts sputum eosinophils. Non-type 2 inflammation, 40 to 60 percent PMNs in the sputum, and no type 2 markers. A comment on beta adrenergic agonist therapy in the treatment of severe asthma. Albuterol is the, stand, is the uh, standard of care as a rescue or nebulization. Uh, I rem remind um, uh, clinicians or healthcare providers that 26 puffs of albuterol approximate one nebulized treatment, so high dose recurrent albuterol during an acute exacerbation every three to five minutes is very reasonable and very appropriate. Leave albuterol, 
uh, or um, or Zopinex um, is reasonable on as well in some uh, groups of individuals who have extreme tachycardia or anxiety. Also, it's very popular in the pediatric population. The older uh, beta agonists, metaproteranol and per, uh, buterol, um, are not available and should not be used secondary to side effect profiles. Long-acting bronchodilators are enormously useful in the management of severe asthma. Conversion altogether to nebulized, for example, Brovana or Performist twice daily is uh, extremely helpful. Uh, with add-on um, uh, short-acting bronchodilators uh, should be considered. Um, also, you can um, these uh, particular long-acting medications are found in uh, Symbacort and Adverdiscus, uh, which are um, frequently um, uh, standbys for this treatment. Inhaled corticosteroids deserve a discussion. There are some that should be used and some that should be disregarded. For example, beclomethazone or QVAR is very commonly prescribed. Um, it's um, the choice for many insurance companies because it's uh, generic and very inexpensive. However, it doesn't work. When I'm forced to use it, I often take these people up to four puffs twice daily or more, um, but it's a, uh, in my opinion, a very useless intervention. Budesonide, either in Pulmacort as a powder or nebulized, is an excellent choice if the insurance companies accept it. Cyclocyanide or cyclocyanide Alvesco is um, difficult to get insurance approval for, nothing wrong with it. Flunicilide, um, definitely not. Uh, fluticasone is the old standby. It works just fine and is uh, very useful for uh, giving an individual high dose inhaled corticosteroids by multiple puffs, sometimes four puffs twice daily. Mometazone, also very reasonable, um, but often not um, insurance approved. Um, and then triamcinolone, asmocort, is a very old therapy and it's in the same, re same realm of QVAR, should not be used. It's not very strong. Now, um, the combination therapies of Symbacort consisting of budesonide and formoterol is very nice because it can be combined with Pulmacort, um, two to four puffs um, in addition, to uh, allow for a high dose inhaled corticosteroid uh, usage in problematic groups. And as well, Advair consisting of fluticasone and salmuterol uh, can be combined with inhaled flutic fluticasone uh, for high dose administration. Typically, I would give someone, for example, Advair discus 500 slash 50 twice daily, and as well add on therapy with Flovent 220 micrograms, one to two puffs twice daily. In some asthmatic populations, this does lead uh, to oral thrush. And if that were to happen and it's problematic, uh, clotrimazole oral trosh 10 milligrams Q6 is not unreasonable or a nice statin swish and spit. Anticholinergic for severe asthma um, have, um, are, are currently being discussed and used, and um, it, it needs to be used in a specific um, asthma phenotype. Um, when I was early in training in the 2000, we tried this particular therapy on uh, type 2 inflammatory asthmatics. It didn't really work that well, and therefore it didn't take off. But I suspect in the non-type 2 inflammation, it may have a role. Um, the autonomic nervous system mediates bronchoconstriction dilation and the release of secretions from the airways via the vagus nerve and acetylcholine. Post-ganglionic fibers end in the airway epithelium, submucosal glands, and the smooth muscle. M1 receptors mediate bronchoconstriction, and then M3 receptors mediate airway smooth muscle contraction and mucus secretion. M2 receptors act as a negative feedback loop, but fortunately, uh, tyotropium has a uh, predilection for M1 and M3, so the M2 receptor is not a factor. And what we see here is a cartoon of acetylcholine in the airways. Um, it originates from the vag vagus nerve uh, in uh, preganglionic uh, neurons, which then um, uh, go to um, a parasympathetic ganglia. Uh, which then projects out via uh, postganglionic nerves uh, to the airway epithelium and uh, to the submucous glands and as well to the, m to the smooth muscle. 
Pyotropium and severe asthma. It's a once a day long acting muscarinic anticholinergic. It reversibly inhibits M1 and M3 receptors in the airway epithelium and smooth muscle of the airways. It's FDA approved in 2014 as an add on therapy in asthma. And I would argue it should be a reasonable choice in non type 2 inflammatory asthma, neutrophilic, and posse granulocytic cautious usage in glaucoma and prostatic hyper hyperplasia. Also, it may aggravate dry mouth, constipation, and urinary retention. And it is a pregnancy category C drug. Leukotrienes are, are an old standby. They are generic and in some phenotypes useful. Um, leukotriene synthesis is activated by microbes, interleukin-4, interleukin-13. Uh, markers of type 2 inflammation, also by cross-linked immunoglobulin E from allergens. The synthesis of leukotrienes occurs in the neutrophil from arachidonic acid and 5-lipoxygenase. Leukotrienes act by binding to the type 1 cystineal leukotriene receptor on inflammatory cells. Uh, the uh, type 1 cystineal uh, leukotriene receptor mediates sustained bronchoconstriction, mucus secretion, and edema in the airways. So in some cases it would be nice to inhibit it. Antagonists are Montelukast and Zafirlukast. Type 2 asthma patients with allergic rhinitis, exercise induced asthma, and aspirin sensitive asthma uh, are your key phenotypes. So these are the three uh, leukotrienes on the market, monoleukast, which is generic and uh, relatively safe with the exception of the development of headaches in a small population of people. And if it were to occur, that medication would have to be stopped. Zafir leukast is outrageously priced and hard to get and therefore not recommended. Xyluton, Zyflo, is an interesting choice. Um, it may have benefit in non-type 2 inflammatory asthma. However, it's an incredibly expensive and requires pre-authorization and therefore uh, not very um, popular. Also, hepatic enzyme uh, monitoring needs to be done for the first three months. Theophylline is the old standby, greater than 50 years um, of uh, history in the treatment of asthma and COPD. It is a non-selective phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Historical 10 to 20 microgram per liter plasma level target um, is uh, usually not our target anymore. However, you need this level, this blood level, to achieve um, effective bronchodilation and mucociliary clearance. Um, more recently, in 2018 and 17, um, we choose low dose, uh, secondary to its anti-inflammatory effects. It inhibits eosinophils and neutrophils in the sputum. Its adenosine receptor antagonism inhibits histamine, leukotrienes, and mast cells. Also, it is inhibitor of nuclear factor kappa beta in the nucleus, which is part of the uh, phenotype of non-type 2 inflammation, and it also induces apoptosis of granulocytes and bronchial walls. Um, you need to be mindful um, of the side effects headache, nausea, vomiting, seizures, arrhythmias, etc. Uh, the way to get around this uh, particular problem is by a very um, cautious and slow tit titration schedule. I usually initiate uh, this therapy uh, with 100 milligrams slow release daily for a week, 200 milligrams for the second week, 300 milligrams for the third week, up to the, uh, the, the, the desired uh, daily dose level. By doing it slowly, these side effect profiles are minimized. I also make it clear that 100 milligrams of theophylline is equivalent to a, uh, eight ounces of uh, black coffee. Uh, so that's usually pretty well tolerated. If you start at the uh, uh, treatment dose right away, um, I can guarantee you most of your patients will stop this medicine from side effects. These are the, the uh, theophylines on the market. Um, Theophylline, uh, also known as Theo24, the long-acting version is very good if you can get it. It's in short supply. And as well, the Unifil um, product, 8 to 12 hours, is very good if you can get it. Azithromycin um, has been discussed uh, for asthma treatment for many years. However, it has taken a new role and has shown dem has demonstrated uh, value, at least in uh, type 2 um, uh, uh, 
non correction non type 2 uh, inflammatory asthma it has extensive anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory and antibacterial effects um, which are useful it's a neutrophil elastase antagonist resulting in decreased mucus it inhibits interleukin 8 which is a PMN attractant and it increases apoptotic cell clearance of PMNs azithromycin has proven to be effective in chronic neutrophilic airway disease we know this as pulmonologists that it's very useful in cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis COPD and as well I, I, I suspect in non type 2 um, neutrophilic predominant asthma. The Azizast, A-Z-I-S-A-S-T, Azizast trial demonstrated that treatment with azithromycin reduces exacerbations in non-eosinophilic severe asthma. The dosage is usually 250 to 500 milligrams three times a week. It's pretty well tolerated. Type 2 asthma biologics pretty much uh, target the cytokines. Um, and, um, and as well the immunoglobulin E molecule. Um, the, um, most, the, uh, the old one which was um, FDA approved in 2003 is uh, Zolair or, or omaluzumab which binds free IgE. Uh, then the anti the anti-interleukin-5 therapies, there's quite a few on the market, mepoluzumab, reslazumab um, which are um, currently FDA approved. Now a discussion of omaluzumab, FDA approved in 2003. Allergens bind immunoglobulin E, uh, which is then um, uh, bound to mast cells um, and uh, basal cells, basal, basophils, leading to degranulation and release of histamine, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes, precipitating bronchospasm. Omaluzumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody uh, specific for immunoglobulin E. Uh, e and type 2 inflammation. Uh, interestingly, this particular event is not inhibited by corticosteroids and is thus uncontrolled in uh, type 2 asthma. It blocks the binding site that IgE interacts with, with mast cells, bas ba basophils, and dendritic cells, and consequently blocks the uh, multitude of downstream inflammatory markers and events. It's tested in allergic asthma. The IgE level initially needs to be greater than 30 international units per ml and a positive aeroallergen skin test. Uh, in, in the U.S., we use the respiratory allergen profile in California, specifically region 14, uh, to identify uh, these individuals. It is uh, pregnancy category B, which is useful. Adverse reactions need to be mindful of, injection site reaction, hypersensitivity, and anaphylaxis. When this is given in the office, you need to watch the patient for one to two hours afterwards and have a, an EpiPen available if anaphylaxis uh, does occur. There really is no increased incidence of malignancy. This was in the product um, uh, information sheet when it came out. Uh, this is not borne out to be true. Allergic uh, type 2 asthma responds well to inhaled corticosteroids and anti-immunoglobulin E therapies. Um, many uh, patients will have a sustained remission of their asthma while on this therapy. Many trials have demonstrated reductions in asthma exacerbations and improvement in asthma control. Clinically significant benefit may not be realized until after three months and sometimes up to six months. $20,000 annual cost. Omeluzumab is a subcutaneous injection every two to four weeks based on body weight and immunoglobulin E levels. Mepoluzumab was FDA approved in 2015. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody that binds to interleukin-5. This results in the reduction in eosinophil activation resulting in therapeutic benefit in severe asthma of the eosinophilic phenotype decreased exacerbation rates and it has a steroid sparing effect. It's about $30,000 annual cost. 100 milligrams are administered subcutaneously every four weeks. Adverse events, injection site reaction. There has been reports of herpes zoster reactivation. Uh, there is a minimum post-marketing information available. I'm not aware of anaphylaxis uh, being an issue, but that needs to be uh, considered until we get more information uh, from post-marketing events. 
Reslizumab, FDA approved in 2016, is an interleukin-5 antagonist monoclonal antibody, also uh, uh, indicated for the treatment of severe asthma with the eosinophilic phenotype. The dosage regimen is 3 milligrams per kilogram once every four weeks by intravenous infusion. It does... Um, it reduces the production and survival of eosinophils and multitude of downstream inflammatory events. Annual costs also 30000 a year. Reduced exacerbations and steroid sparing effect has been combined, by the way, with mepoluzumab in some cases. Anaphylaxis has been observed with the Syncare infusion, the trade name, in about 0.3% percent of patients. Therefore, the individual needs to stay in the office for a couple hours after infusion uh, with an EpiPen standby. Adverse events have been described to include uh, elevation of CPK and myalgia. Uh, ben Benralzumab uh, was FDA approved in 2017. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody selective for the interleukin-5 receptor alpha subunit. It, its binding leads to uh, apoptosis of eosinophils and basal, basophils through antibody-dependent cell-mediated toxicity. 30 milligrams are administered once every four weeks for the first three doses and then once every eight weeks thereafter by subcutaneous injection. It is another add-on therapy for severe eosinophilic asthma. Tezapelumab um, is a human monoclonal antibody specific for epithelial cell-derived cytokine thymic stromal lymphoprotein. That's a mouthful. So, uh, in a phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, lower rates of asthma exacerbations independent of baseline blood eosinophil counts. Hence, you may see benefits in both type two and non-type two severe asthma. It has important effects on interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13 pathways. Hopefully, it'll be available in 2018. The final uh, treatment we'll discuss is bronchial thermoplasty. Uh, it's bronchoscopic application of controlled thermal energy to the bronchial wall during three serial procedures, results in a reduction of airway smooth muscle mass, reducing airway contractility, and obstruction of airflow is diminished. It's FDA approved for patients with severe persistent asthma, inadequately controlled on inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting bronchodilators. Now, this particular intervention may be very useful in uh, non-type 2 inflammation and posse granulocytic asthma. Um, and um, uh, studies thus, thus far have shown a persistence of therapeutic effect for at least two years as uh, evidenced by the rates of exacerbations and stable FEV1. Uh, in my experience and practice, um, these individuals, when I do bronchial thermoplasty, need to be intubated. It results in a more effective and more tolerable procedure and sometimes need to be admitted overnight secondary to exacerbation of their asthma afterwards. Um, the benefits I've seen uh, occur, uh, as stated, about three to six months after uh, after the intervention and persist and they have persisted in my group of patients uh, for up to five years it's very interesting very helpful and um, the only problem is trying to get insurance approval uh, for this procedure which is very expensive